I want to just uh, cover the main objective for the next six weeks um, for this entire course is that um, our goal is to diversify our approaches to prayer. Uh, so the, what we're going to do for the first three weeks is we are going to practice uh, I'm gonna, a variety of different ways of personal prayer. So these are the types of approaching God that are formative for us the ones that cultivate a personal relationship with God. For the last three weeks, um, we're going to start learning and in practicing the type of prayer that involves ministering to one another. Because the prayer um, that, comes, that, that spreads out to one another comes out of our personal formation with God. There are very dangerous things that happen when somebody who has no formed relationship with God tries to minister to somebody else. So we're going to make sure we're going to work on the formative sides of prayer. And then we're going to get into uh, the, the ministry side. A um, couple of key things uh, before we begin. Let me pray. We're going to get into all of this stuff. And then we're going to get into the details of the piece of paper from the uh, first edition School of Prayer notes. But let's just pause for a second. Can we just kind of go to the Lord together um, and, uh, and ask Him to walk through? This is not about me. Uh, this is just about us coming together as the people of God to learn to engage with God and each other better. So let's pray. Father, uh, we come boldly before your throne tonight. Uh, Lord, and, and there will be those that join us uh, partway through the series. And God, we just pray that anyone who comes to be a part of this, Lord, that we would be aware of your presence. Lord, that is the one thing that would be said of this, Lord, is that we grew in connection with you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would make it easy for us to sense your proximity and your affection for us. Lord, we pray for strength and courage as we may have to uh, engage with you differently. Lord, we pray for focus as well. And Father, I pray for myself that uh, you would lead me, Lord, that this would not be about me or about what I have to say, but God, that you would use me to help train your people to connect with you in a deeper way. We love you, we trust you, and we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, a couple of things as we get started. Some key things before we begin. Um, number one, there is a you. If you haven't, there is a double-sided piece of paper that are the abbreviated notes from the first edition of Prayer School. If you attended Prayer School One it, back in 2020, you have all of these notes and more. But for those that weren't a part of it, I wanted to give you the important key notes because it covers some very important pieces of information about what prayer is, about, about kind of how we're supposed to be approaching it with our perspective. I will not be going over that this for the next six weeks. My assumption is that you're coming in with some level of an understanding of prayer. And if you don't, that piece of paper is going to save your life. So make sure you have a copy at least, and I'm going to expect that throughout the six weeks you go over all of it. I advise that you make time to read it as soon as you possibly can, but not to the point where you miss everything else here. Um, so number two, read, so number one is read the notes from the first edition of Prayer School. Number two, here's what I need. Last time we did this, I had fill in the blanks. That will not be happening this time. I don't want you to take notes. I want you to take note. I want us to come into our time here with asking God to just kind of stir our hearts. And so something that God draws your attention to or something that God, that, that God kind of hits you with and you're like, I'm, I'm, I feel like God is kind of just leading me in this direction. That's what I want you to write down. I don't want to give you fill in the blanks for anything. I will have notes for people that aren't here on certain weeks that I'll be able to give you some of the details. So you're not going to miss anything. Um, all of my PowerPoint, I'm going to see if I can make that available as well because it'll have the basic information. But I don't want you, I don't want you just listening and trying to write down everything that we talk about because it will actually take away from what we are trying to do. Number three, I want you all right now to begin to think of someone that you're going to be leading through this or sharing this with because you're going to have to explain this to somebody. The reason I want you to do that is because it will allow us to engage actively and not passively. This will allow us to actually, like, you never learn something more effectively than when you have to teach it. Okay? Jared, if I had you teach on Leviticus, 
you would be like the most informed dude in the region on Leviticus, right? I'm not going to make you do that right now, okay? I'm holding that maybe for the future, but not, not today. Um, so I want you to think of somebody, seriously, I want you to take a moment. I want you to think of somebody like I might, this is someone that I'm going to have a conversation with about prayer, and I want to be able to explain these things to them. So that's what I want. Number four, please understand that we are all on the same team. This has happened more often than it should. But there are some of us that come into a place that are really, like that pray a lot. And there are some that come in that have no prayer life whatsoever. And what I don't want you to do if you're either of those people, I don't want you to feel, number one, not that anyone here would, but I don't want there to be an arrogance or a pride of like, I pray so much. Like we're not Pharisees, right? And on the other end, I don't want people to feel like, well, I, I don't feel like I have anything to contribute. or any, my, I think my questions are stupid because I don't pray at all. We are all on the same team. We are all here to learn, to be equipped, and to grow. That will be the focus that we take over the next six, seven weeks. It's going to be seven because next week's Halloween. We're going to get to that in a second. Don't worry. But that's what I'm asking us all to do. Please understand, we are all on the same team. If you, You'll have questions. There'll be time for questions through all of this. Um, and for us to be able to engage with those together. But I don't want you to feel that if you're on either end of the spectrum, that somehow you have nothing to add or it's not worth learning what you want to learn. Does that make sense? Okay. The last thing is if you have questions, you can email me those questions, dean at newlifepetrolia.com. So if you have a question about prayer or, or you have of, uh, like something that you're just curious about, whether everything from anything related to prayer at all, you send it to me an email. If it's something that I get enough on, I might address it as part of our lessons because I want to be able to help you with your question. But what it'll also do is it might help me understand kind of where you're coming from in prayer. We might be able to have a private conversation about it. So everything from deliverance ministry to right, like praying for healing. Hey, why doesn't God heal everybody? All of, ask those questions. Lock and load. Dean at newlifepetrolia.com. Are you with me? All right. Huh. One of the difficulties in our prayer life is that we often run in, hey, let's pray quick. If you were part of the first edition of prayer school, you would have heard us talk about this a number of times. One of the problems that we bring from our life into prayer is that we're trying to do things quickly. We will not be doing that. At prayer school. So we're going to take our time. The first thing I want us to take our time on is I want us to ask these, I want you to ask yourself these three questions. And we're going to give you, I'm going to give you five minutes to do it. You're not, you don't have to share it with anybody. Okay. Introverts, you're welcome. All right. But I want you, and Rebecca's going to just put some music on, but I want you to take some time and genuinely answer these questions. And the answer might legitimately be, I don't know. But I, we need to understand these things about ourselves in order to be able to move forward with what we're learning. Does that make sense? So Rebecca, go ahead and just put music up for me. Five minutes and we'll come back here, but I want you to answer these questions and write down the answers.
How was that? How was it? Were these questions, did you find them easy to answer? No. Okay, for those that found it difficult, what was the hardest question to come up with an answer for? I'll wait, guys. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, they're designed to be hard. They're designed to get us to get to the heart of what we're here, what we're looking for. Because that is one of the most fundamental practices of prayer. So much of our time with God is about understanding, God, what am I looking for? Why am I here? Why, like, it's so much of it is about evaluating and understanding ourselves. And there's no safer place to do that than the presence of God. And one of the things that we are going to have to practice a way more than you think you signed up for, for those that signed up. If you didn't, you're like, I get to skip that. One of the things we have to practice, we're going to have to practice asking ourselves hard questions. So when we get to like week two and week three, you're going to have to come prepared because the questions get a lot harder than this. Because we have to be able to slow down and evaluate. And, and that's, in a really fast-paced and loud world, there's lots of chatter. That's really hard to do. So I'm not asking you for answers for these questions. These are for you and for you alone. Remember, what we're going to go through is designed to be formative between you and God. It's not to sit there and talk. You don't have to. You can share with one another. We're on the same team. But I want. And part of this is we have to look inward really, really hard. Yes, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, if you don't know and you want to go back and get, do you have the prayer notes from prayer school number one? Okay. If you read that, that'll help. Um, having casual conversation. Oh, sorry. If you were, if you signed up uh, and you have your book that's over there, go and grab it. If you didn't sign up, I think we have extras first come first serve. But in the middle, there are the abbreviated notes from School of Prayer, number one. Um, it's going to cover some of the details about what prayer is and some of the key things for perspective. So the question she, she, she was asking is, do you, care, do you consider casual conversation with God to be prayer? And the answer is yes. You wait till we get to the parts of prayer where you don't say anything. That's, that's week three. That's going to be hard. Um, and so any time that we're, we're connecting with God, I, I, Rich Belotus, who's uh, the uh, lead pastor of a, a church in, in Brooklyn, uh, he calls prayer opening up oneself to God, right? Um, and so anything that we can to connect, even if it's casual conversation, is, is a form of prayer. Um, one of the hard things for me when I was wrestling with these questions is the last one where it says, describe your current prayer life, because I always have the tendency to describe what my prayer life used to be. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I spend 30 minutes in prayer a day. And I like, okay, there was a time when that was the case, but my current as it is right now, I have to kind of be honest about the reality with that. And so um, it's a great question. Anybody else have a question before we move on here? We're not even there. This is the deep breath before the plunge, y'all. Like we're not even in, this is preliminary. This is just set up. That's all this is. Anybody have another question at all or anything? Because we're about to actually get started here. Um, does, that, does that answer your question, by the way? Okay, great. 
Uh, so here we go. This is the this is the deep breath. Some tips and tools and tricks for you. Okay. Um, this is going to be. This has been for me one of the the, the easiest, uh, most easy to apply lessons for me in prayer that have turned into uh, probably the biggest blessings for me as I've learned to engage in prayer. Uh, number one, don't worry about what you are supposed to pray. Just be genuine. A lot of times we come in and we're like, okay, like I'm, I'm trying to come into a time with God. What, what should I be praying about? Don't worry about that. Don't worry about it. Just be genuine. Okay? There's no point in trying to be disingenuous to God. He knows everything anyway. So don't worry about what you're supposed to pray. Just be genuine. Number two, start with the amount of time that you can. So if we're going to talk about spending 30 minutes in prayer with God, some of you are like, that is impossible. And I understand. God understands that. Like, like life, a prayer life is just that. It is a life. And so if you can't do 30, can you do five? Can you, can you do two minutes? Can you do one minute? Don't be dogmatic about the time that you spend. Some of us, that, that's a really good structure. But I don't want you to feel like, well, because I can't spend a lot of time, I'm not as holy or not as close to God as people who get. Let me tell you, if you spend 30 seconds of genuine connection with God, it beats 30 minutes of just pretending. Like there were people, there were people who just touched the hem of his garment and their life was changed forever. Okay? Like if all you get from him is just a touch, it can change your life. Right? So don't be worried about the amount of time. Number three, write it down. Do not do what people like me do, where you convince yourself, I'll remember. Don't, don't, don't do, don't be Dean. Don't, don't be Dean in this situation. Write it down. There is a reason that we have notebooks provided. And it's not because it was just something neat. It was because it is a, a valuable resource for what we're going to do. And here's why you want to write it down. Number one, because in times of genuine connection with God, you want to remember what he says. You want to remember where you are. You want to remember like your engagement. Number two, when you begin to forget the things that God has dealt with you, you can go back and have a record of it. Number three, as you go through the months and the years, you have this beautiful tapestry of what God has been doing in your life. You have a record of all the highs and lows. Sometimes that, that writing it down might be like, I really struggled today. Like. I had that song stuck in my head, or I just, I just didn't make the time. And, and, and that's, that's okay. And the reason is because you want to be able to look back on your journey and see God's fingerprints through it all. It does wonders to build your faith and your confidence in what God is doing. Uh, number four, have a prayer place. One of the things that Jesus had was he had places that he would go to pray. There is something incredible. We covered this in, in first edition of prayer school. Something incredible happens when you have a place, whether it's a room, whether it's a play, like a walking route of where you, you were like, I am going into this place to meet with God. And something in your head sh like shifts and changes and a switch is flipped when you're like, I, every time I come into this room, I'm coming to this room to meet with God. I'm telling you, your focus gets like elevated. Like you come in and all of us, like, you, you understand what it meant for them to go into the holy place. That can be the front seat of your car on the commute. Like, God, when I come into this, when I, when I get into my car, I'm coming in, I'm, I'm meeting with you. Even if I don't say a thing. I just, I just I want it to be you and I want it to be me. And then when, you're, when, when your mind begins to go over the details of your day, you're not doing it on your own power, under your own logic, you're kind of doing it in the presence of God. You're giving God opportunity to kind of get involved. We're going to come to the praying of our days a little bit later on in the series, but it's an incredible blessing to have a place, whether it's a walking route, whether it's a room, whether it's the front seat of your car. Some of you, it's a closet. I, I, I'm just, it helps. That's all I'm saying. It helps. Uh, number five, be patient and kind to yourself. The thing I run into the most often when I teach on prayer, when I walk disciple people through praying, is that I, I'm, I'm amazed at how much they beat themselves up because they feel like they're not measuring up to the standard. Like, there are a lot of people that are like, 
I, I didn't get any prayer time. And they sit there and they're like, like, don't, don't, don't do that. Do you think, like, do you, do you, do you think God is being like, for shame? Right? Um, <laughs> uh, Pope Francis, whatever your opinion on Pope Francis is, is irrelevant. Uh, he gave a, one of the most beautiful answers to someone who was asking him about prayer. Um, <laughs> someone came up and said, uh, and said, I'm, uh, Ask him a question. I'm having a problem in prayer because every time I try to go and set aside time to pray in the early morning, I fall asleep. How can I pray more and not fall asleep? And I'll never forget it. He said, uh, he said, you don't need more prayer. You need more sleep. You, you don't need another trick in your bag. You need more sleep. Like you are allowed to fall asleep. Don't shame yourself for it. Don't beat yourself up over it. We're on the same team here. So if you, while we're practicing, and we're going to get to this in a second, while we're practicing some of the, the, the approaches that we're going to learn, if someone is sitting here praying and then you see them snoring, the only reason we disturb them is if they're disturbing you. Okay? It happens. You want to know why? Because the bo human body and mind cannot fall asleep unless it feels it's in a safe place. And so as we slow things down, as we cut out the visual noise, and we're not sitting here scrolling on our phone, sometimes your body's hitting the off switch. Don't shame yourself for that. We're not going to shame each other for that. All right? And if you're snoring like really loudly where it sounds like a bear attack, then we're probably going to like wake you up so you're not distracting everybody else. We'll just move you to another spot in the building. This building's huge. Okay? Don't shame yourself for it. Um, okay. Show of hands. How many people here would say, for the most part, that they pray more than 60 minutes a week. Hands up. Okay. You're the people I'm talking to right now. For the people whose hands were not up, I want you to listen. All right? Uh, for the people that have their hands raised, what is a thought, a practice, or a tool that has consistently helped you establish your prayer life or make the most of your prayer life? For those of you who are praying 60 minutes a week, Give me something. We're going to do kind of a community toolbox. Yes. Okay. Right. 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 It makes things so much easier. Next person. Who? Yeah, go ahead. Correct. Yeah, it, it really is that simple. Okay, anybody else? People that were praying ones? Yeah, go ahead. Right. 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 Yeah. Giving God the first fruits of your day. Yeah. Like the primacy of God, the first thing I want to do is spend time with you. And it really does frame your whole day. Okay. Who else? Somebody? Yeah, go ahead. Right. Love that. Uh, one of the things that's, that's helped me uh, is, uh, do you, is your hand yet? Go ahead, yes. Uh, one of the things that's helped me is that uh, for people whose minds race with like, okay, I got this coming up, I got this coming up, I got that. Like, I don't write anything down on my calendar. It's all up here, which is really bad because it plays constantly. You have to, I've learned that if I write things down and I give myself permission, I'm going to address these things once I'm done. It removes the burden of my mind of having to focus and keep me up to date on all the things. Anyway, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah.
Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, just into every... Um, uh, unfortunately, because not a lot of people write on prayer in recent years that aren't like wackadoodles, um, some of the most consistent writing on prayer over the last hundred years have all been monks. Uh, Catholic monks, Protestant monks. Um, and one of those men, uh, his name is Ron Rollhauser. He's, uh, Ron Rollheiser is his name. Um, who wrote, ex he's written extensively on prayer. This is, and I'm bringing this up because you touched on something. He was really the first one to kind of describe, uh, prayer as opening up oneself to God. This is where Rich Velotis gets it from. And his conclusion was this, is that when we view prayer in that way, every thought and every feeling becomes an access point to prayer. Every thought and every feeling, every experience becomes an entry point into prayer. When we view it like, God, I just, I just want to open up my mo like this moment, how, what I'm experiencing, what I'm thinking, what I'm feeling, what I'm about to do. When I open myself up to God into every, every single moment, every single thought, every single action becomes an entry point into prayer. And so you're, you're hitting the nail on the head where it's not just like, although there's really great times of structured, scheduled times. If we only view prayer in that way, we become dogmatic in that way, we actually rob ourselves of the richness of seeing God active and intimate throughout every moment of the day, right? Um, uh, this actually comes from Rebecca's biology teacher. Uh, my wife, Rebecca, is not feeling well, but she's still in the sound booth. Thank you. That's on camera. Yeah, you know. Um, she, I, when I was asking her this question, she said uh, she had a biology teacher who said, whatever you do, tell yourself that it is the most important thing. Because when your body understands that, it helps you focus. And so when we spend time with God, as we go in, like, I need to tell myself this is the most important thing. And something happens with that level of intention and that level of focus as we get distracted a little bit less. Um, uh, for me, another one is I, I walk physically. Like I, I don't stand still well. You all know me on this stage. I pace like a caged animal. Um, and so it helps for me to be active. It's hard for me to slow myself down. And so me going for walks helps as well. Um, the reason I wanted to go through it is because I wanted there to kind of be a community toolbox of some of the things for those of us that have a bit more of a consistent prayer life, some of the things that we've learned the hard way. None of us learn that the easy way. Um, we want to be able to kind of equip one another with it. And so I wanted you to kind of hear from those who are doing it. Are you ready for the actual, we're just getting, this is, this is pre preliminaries. So for the next 30 minutes, for the next 30 minutes till 7.30, I'm going to go through this material. And then for the last 30 minutes is the target of every evening from 7.30 to 8. We're going to spend time practicing the approach that we just learned about. Okay? So that's the, when we start at 6.30, we'll 6.30 to 7.30 with the actual teaching component. And then for the last 30 minutes, we're going to start it actually practicing because we're going to actually pray. Jesus said, my, you know, my father's house will be a house of prayer. Well, guess what? Okay? And so we're, we're going to learn. We're going to learn. And so here we go. The very first approach that I want us to cover is praying the scriptures. When you do not know what to pray, pray the scriptures. When life is a mess, pray the scriptures. When your day begins and you're like, I got to spend time with God, pray the scriptures. Okay, this is why like you should be able to reach your 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 Bible before your phone. That's a different message for a different day. Um, but like, but but one causes you to slow down and focus, right? You know. One causes you to focus here, and one just distracts you with everything else that's going on. So pray the scriptures. Now, when we talk about praying the scriptures, most of you actually have done this approach before. You may just have, this is going to happen in one of two ways. We're going to get that here in a second. Um, but the scriptures, most of you have used in your prayers, and it's an important component because it provides us with the strongest bulwark possible when dealing with our life, with ourselves, with everything in it, in all of our relationships, scriptures anchor us in what God has already said. 
I, I, I need us to understand this. There's a lot of us that are like, God, I'm just looking for a word from you. And, and it's been in the Scriptures the whole time. Right? Like, like a lot of us, like, God, I need a fresh word, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with, like, I, like there's nothing wrong with that. But we want to anchor ourselves in what God has already said. When we're dealing with fear or grief or loss or confusion, and we have emotional seasons where we can kind of quickly get swept away, if you're not anchored in something unchanging and permanent, life gets hard. So when things go sideways, anchor yourself in the Scriptures. You need something that doesn't change. Something that, is, that has been permanent since the very beginning, the, the very thing that kind of spoke you into existence. And so this is why it's so important. And I, will just, I want to make it clear, when you do not know what to pray, pray the Scriptures. And so this praying the Scriptures comes in two forms. And we're going to go through both of them. Okay? The two forms is what I affectionately refer to as campfires and railroads. Campfires and railroads. I know it sounds folksy yet progressive. I know. Um, this, is the, uh, this is the easiest split that we'll have in terms of understanding. Conceptually, it's going to make sense. Campfires, campfires is probably the method that everybody here has done. Campfire approach to prayer is when we use the Scriptures as a campfire. This is where we, we, we read a couple of verses and we meditate on it. We, we dwell, we consider deeply. Is when, I, when I say meditate, I don't want us to have the idea of like Eastern practices. Um, when I say meditate, I mean stopping life and allowing us to kind of just let it fill us up and wash over us, the, the Scriptures and, and, and what they're saying to us. If you've ever had a devotional where you've read a bit of Scripture and read something and then you went into the prayer, this is kind of what you've done. Um, and so it, this is where we go and we use a Scripture verse. Any, of the mo majority of the Scriptures can be used for this. Of where we read something and we stop and we're like, okay, God. Let your word speak to me. What, what, what do I need from your scriptures? From this, what can I get? What can I glean from your word, from this story, from this passage? When, when, if you're not really sure how to approach prayer, this is, this is the easiest method to use. And so it's where we, you know, you just read a couple verses. You're not reading an entire, like, okay, you're not like reading five chapters. You're reading just a couple of, of, of verses and you stop and you allow that portion of Scripture to illuminate your time with God. When we talk about a campfire, it's because we sit there and we allow it to warm us and provide light for us, and we allow it to kind of be this thing that we're camping out on. This is, this is the easiest form of prayer to get you started. Um, and you have to ask questions. We're going to get into how to properly do this here in a, in a moment or two. But we're saying, Lord, what do I need from the Scripture today? What can the Scripture give me today? So, for example, if you were to read Exodus 3, and you would have to quietly meditate on what the passage reveals, for those that don't know, Exodus 3 is the burning bush. Exodus 3 is the time of where Moses comes, the call of Moses. And you sit there and you read it, and you're like, God, what, what can I get? What, 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 this, what could this teach me? Like, help, help me understand what your scriptures have been saying since they were, since you spoke them into existence. Let me understand. Like, there's, there's so much where the Spirit of God in the form of fire in a bush says, take off your sandals for you are walking on holy ground. Where the, where the, where the, where the presence of God is is a holy space. And you sit there and you're like, God, like, your presence makes me holy. No matter how wretched and broken and gross I am, God, with your presence, Moses had committed murder. And God said, Moses, come, come to me. You can look at it where he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go back to Pharaoh. And I want you to speak my truth. And he's like, so they're going to kill me? And number two, I have a stutter. He did not say it that eloquently. 
Anybody know Exodus 3? What happened? In response to that problem, someone, come on. He's like, I will send Aaron. He's already on his way. He will be your mouthpiece. Can we just take a moment? If you're reading that scripture and you allow and you just meditate, God, like, let me get it. And God's like, I understand your weaknesses. Your weaknesses do not derail my plans for you and for my people. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. It's really going to cook your noodle. This is, see, this is out of my prayer life, which is why I'm so deep in this right now. What's really going to cook your noodle is God could have used a stuttering man. But God in his grace said, you know what? I'm not going to push it with you. I'll have a work around it. Isn't that nuts? But God, I can't. I know you can't. Your help should be arriving right now. You see my point? Where you sit there and you, you meditate, you just kind of let it warm your hands and your heart and you allow it to illuminate your day or the time that you're reading and you're just like, God, what can I, what, what can, let your scriptures teach me something about you. Like this is food for the spirit, right? Like literal food for the spirit. And some of you are spiritually hangry. That's a different message for a different day. Okay, some of you like things that used to be easy but aren't. Like where you're like, it used to be so easy for me to pray. It used to be so easy. Like, honestly, I just, I feel like it's because you actually haven't fed enough. It's a different message for a different day. And so using this, message, using this method allows us to be able to do it. And so there are, there are two things the campfire method does for us. The first thing is, is it gets you into the Word and the Word into you. You cannot pray the Scriptures if you do not know the Scriptures. Some of you, this is the best thing ever because you get to do, uh, do the whole two birds, one stone thing because you get to read your Bible and you get to pray all in one exercise with the same coffee. You don't even have to go and get a second coffee at another part of the day. No, you guys, not, yeah, you guys aren't the people that like romanticize the early morning sunrise, the steam coming off the coffee with your Bible open, where you're like, I'm tempted to Instagram this right now. You're allowed to laugh at that. It's fine even if you've done it. No shame. We get it. But this allows you to do both. So the first thing it does is it gets us into the Word, and it gets the Word into us. You see, you learn the Bible, and it teaches you to go to the Scriptures and actually engage with them. When I say that it gets you into the Word, so many of us read as a form of discipline, and we never get from the discipline to the duty to the delight. Right? Like, 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 we leave it as something I have to do, and so we do it as a, a we kind of just to get through it, as if you're kind of reading a textbook, and we never kind of allow it to get to a point of delight of where we actually begin to engage with the Scriptures. But using this method, you are forced to engage with the Scriptures that you're reading. You're forced to give God a moment to speak through His Word to you. It's one of the great benefits of it. Number two is it trains our attention. Uh, it sets our mind on things above. I, 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 have, I have a truckload of notes here that I am not going to go through because I don't think that we need to be educated to this level, but I will simply remind us of this. There are people in this world, one of the greatest businesses in this world, they get paid for your attention. The greatest commodity in the world today is not gold. It's your attention. Everything you see on TV, on the internet, social media, everything you hear literally has been designed by an architect to hold on to your attention, to capture and hold on to. I want you to hear the words capture and hold on to. There's a word for that in the English language. It's called hostage. It has literally been crafted to hold your attention hostage. When we use this, it teaches, it trains our attention to set on the things of God and not on the chatter of the world. All of the political posts you see are, and even, even from reputable websites and like news sites, are specifically worded to not give you all the information that you're looking for and to elicit some form of an emotion. Right? Like it's designed to make you angry. Or it's designed to make you like super curious. Like we, we have clickbait and rage bait and all of like, there are things that are said specifically so inflammatory 
as to get you to want to comment your rage. This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen, right? Um, you know the, uh, I'll give you a real life example. Did you ever hear the story of a little girl who was going to school and she's dressed as a cat and the school allowed her to bring a litter box, right? It's not a real story. It was made up. Not one instance of that actually happening. Total hoax. But they got your click, didn't it? The world is doing that to you. And now we have robots doing it for like you have an algorithm. Like it's a thing that says, oh, they like this kind of content. I'm going to feed it. So every time your attention gets grabbed and you click on something, it's going to feed you more of that. Everything is trying to pull your attention. And who gets your attention last more often than not? where you're climbing in exhausted into bed at the end of the day going, Lord, you know I love you. And I'll talk to you tomorrow. This method, this method pulls the cord on that parachute and allows you to slow things down and it trains our attention. Rather than when something is trying to make you angry. It's trying to make you lustful. It's trying, and it, it all plays for the same team, guys. It all plays for the same team. No matter what end of whatever spectrum it is, it's all playing on the same. It wants your attention. You comment, they make money. You share it, they make money. Okay? Every second that you're on that page, algorithms like, we're going to feed you more of this concept. The only way to stop it, this. Lord, don't let them captivate me. I want to I lift my eyes up above to the things above. The scriptures say, set your mind on the things above. This allows us to do that. With me? Here's how to use the campfire method well. Um, this, has been, uh, this has been elaborated on by uh, a lot of theologians, uh, a, lot of, a lot of monks, for the last 200 years, you can find all of their books online for free, and they all talk about this particular process. I, I've changed some of the words to make it a bit more accessible than King James English. But here's how to use the campfire method well, okay? So you're going to find a passage of Scripture. It's going to be a couple of verses. It's not going to be an entire... I mean, if you're a fast reader, you know what to cover. But you're going to read a portion of Scripture, and you're going to read it more than once. Read, okay? Read it once, read it a second time, engage with it, because the first time we don't always get all the little details and stuff like that. And then we're going to ask the question. We're going to ask the question, what is going on in this passage? When you read it, you're going to ask questions of the text. What on earth is going on? Okay, we want to understand what is actually happening. We don't want to just quote things because it sounds good. Um... We want to know what's going on. Okay, don't do a huge study. Okay, I don't want you like pulling out like commentaries and going into the Greek. That's not what this is for. It's just to ask a quick text question so that we understand what's going on. So you're going to read. The second step is going to be meditate. This is where we purposely slow things down. Do you know uh, monasticism? This is why monks are the ones that read uh, write on prayer, by the way. Maybe you don't know this. So we all think of a monk. You know what you're thinking about, right? Like the hood and like the arms and the sleeves and the cradle, hilo, hilo. Right? Do you know that monasticism is was designed? This is this is its purpose. This is where the word comes from. It means to purposely slow down. Monks were people that just purposely slow, like pulled out all the extras of life to slow things down, so they could spend more time with God. And look, it. I'm not saying become a monk, okay? But I'm saying that there is a process here of intentionally slowing life down that might really work. Do you know what was born out of that? Meditation. Of where to sit and to set your mind, shut out everything else, give it your full attention, and just let it wash over you. Just let it cover. Sit there and read the scriptures, and you're like, God, let me just sit with this for a second. Like when you have someone who's telling their story and They've been through some real nasty stuff. And they're like, so anyway, like my dad was shot when he was robbed on a train and they just move on. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Can you say that again slow enough to where you feel it? 
because you've told the story so many times. You know what I mean? When we meditate, even though it's a scripture that you've probably read hundreds of times in your life, when you slow down, allow yourself to feel it. That's the process of meditation. So we're not talking about, when we say meditate, we're not talking about emptying ourselves. That's foolishness. Okay? We're not just letting anything capture our attention and all of this. not what we're doing. What we're doing is we're slowing things down and allowing the Word of God and His presence to be the thing that we just sit and cover ourselves in. God, nothing else in the world matters. Let me understand your scriptures. You begin to go over it. And so you meditate. And this is, this is as you read the scriptures, as you go through and you read the story, maybe there's something that jumps out at you and you want to underline it. This is when you ask the question, Lord, what might you be saying to me through this scripture? God, feed me from your word right now. Let me, let me, let me feed from your word right now. What, what would you have for me from your word today? These, these are questions asked in a form of meditation. This is where we force ourselves to slow down and actually engage. Maybe there's just something so relevant for your life. You know, uh, there's a passage, I think it's in 2 second, second Peter, second Peter 5, maybe 1 Peter 5, where uh, he says, and after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace will restore you and strengthen you and establish you. And when he was writing to his persecuted Christians, but let me tell you, my spirit on more than one occasion has sat there when God, the God of all grace, will restore and establish. And one of the beautiful things about a relationship we have, especially in the Pentecostal tradition, one of the relationships we have with God is that we get to know what God is saying to us right here in this moment, in this very situation. It's such a beautiful thing. And so that's part of meditation. Ask God, feed me from your word. Lord, what might you be saying to me? What might be jumping out to your attention? And you can underline it. Number three is where you pray. Uh, the most common thing that monks have said about this is to offer some words to God. In light of what you've just read. In light of letting it wash over you. And asking those questions. And slowing things down. Offer some words to God. God, help me understand that it's you who calls. Let me, under let me help me understand that even though I think I stutter, even though, I, even though I'm giving you every reason to think that I'm not capable, God, that because it is your will, you will, you will enable me. That even, God, that you accept broken gifts from broken people. Where he, like, and I'm, I'm, this is all coming out of just the scriptures that I've, I've been reading leading up to this. Like, of where I sit there and I offer to God, God, thank you. Uh, Psalm 119, 132 says, Be gracious with me, O God, as is your way with those who love your name. Guide my steps according to your steadfast love and do not let iniquity gain dominion over me. And I read that and I'm like, God, let me be part of your domain and domain alone. Don't let me give up the seed of authority of my life to anything else. You see what I'm doing? I'm offering some words to God as a result of something that I've, I've read in the scriptures. Does that make sense? To offer some words. Number four, we're going to contemplate. This is where, you know, the scriptures, it says, be still and know. This is what contemplation is. So we're not going over the Scripture. This is not the time. The contemplation stage is not the time to be wondering about the Scripture that you just read. That ended when you offered some words to God because of it. And now, now you sit and you're silent in God's presence. You're just a, a, a common way of the monks that, that write on this. They say, offering your presence to the Lord. God, just let me offer my presence. But what could I possibly say? Let me just be here in your presence. I offer nothing. And just sit there and be silent before the Lord. Just be in His presence. And if your thoughts drift, as they always do for me, gently just bring them back. Just gently lead your thoughts back. Okay, hold on. God, I want to be focused on you right now. And you sit there and you don't say anything. And you're just leading yourself well. You just make sure your thoughts come in. Lead your mind back to God. And the fifth step is action. And as a result of some things that God might say to you, you might have to, do, like, God might be asking you to do something, or maybe you're like, you know what, God, I need to cut out my Netflix time. I need to be able to do this at, the, at the, another part of the day, right? So, God, I do this in the morning, and I might need, I'm just noticing at nighttime that my thoughts race, and I do all the, you know what, God, I just feel from your scriptures, from my time with you, I need to kind of spend some time with you at night to give you the night. Like, just things like that. So, the fifth step is action. So, we read, we meditate, we pray, we contemplate. And then action. If, if God is leading you to do something, don't do it out of guilt. Okay? We're not responding to the impetus within us that makes us want to do foolish things because we feel like we aren't enough. 
Don't do that. That's what we're going to do. Does that make sense? Any questions about this method? Wow. So either I'm doing a really good job or you guys aren't understanding anything at all. All right. I look at I am ready to roll those dice. Um, we're going to move on to the second one, railroad method. The railroad method is this, where the campfire method is about camping out on one scripture and letting that scripture warm us and illuminate it. It is kind of becomes the home that we have for a time of prayer. The railroad method is where we use the form and the structures of the scriptures as our way forward. So this is where you begin to read a psalm or you might read lamentations of where you allow the natural structure. So rather than just reading something and sitting here just meditating on it, sometimes you got to read the scriptures and you just you just go through it. In the same way that someone might go through like a the the like a serenity's prayer, like that kind of thing of where we use a natural scripture to be a this is this is where we go um it's where we go to a part of the scriptures that pertain to kind of what we need or what we're going through, and we allow the structure of that scriptures kind of to carry us through, like a, like a train on a railway. You don't do anything. You just allow the structure to carry you through. Does that make sense? Does the imagery make sense? I promise you it's going to make a lot more sense here in a second when we get into the deep dive of this particular portion. This is where we search the scriptures for the thing that we need or the thing that we need to be reminded of or the thing that we need God to be reminded of. This is where we go to the Scriptures and we're like, God, I, I need this from you. And we go and we find that in the Scriptures, and we sit there and we read it, and it, that structure of the psalm, or that structure of the book of Lamentation, that structure within the Scripture, becomes we just, we just read through it and we allow it to be our, we don't sit there and ponder, we just kind of let it carry us through the structure. And all of you know this, all of you know this, because all of you, for the most part, have prayed the Lord's Prayer. All of you, right? And so the, the, what really should be the disciples' prayer, but that's beside the point because it was Jesus teaching them to pray. But anyway, you know, you see my point of where you begin like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And you go through the structure of where you allow it to carry you through. Here's where this comes into play. The railroad method is where when life becomes a mess, when fear or grief or loss come into play and the emotions are so loud, railroad method. Easy way to remember, use the railroad method when you've been railroaded. Now you know why I called it that. Let me explain to you what I mean, because some of you might not quite have an understanding. Um, this actually comes uh, from... A uh, guy by the name of Chad Bird. Chad Bird is the uh, resident, a scholar in residence at 1517. Uh, it's a Christian organization um, that has like a lot of PhD people involved in it. They do a lot of like uh, heavy academic work. He's one of the uh, the, the scholars in residence there, so he's one of the people that write a lot of articles for them. Uh, Chad Bird and his wife are 49 years old, um, and they uh, last year suffered the tragic loss of their 21-year-old son in a hiking accident. Um, and uh, obviously it wrecked them. Uh, and he said that when life hits you hard and you don't know which way is up, the structures of some of the scriptures are some is the only way forward. When, you're, when the emotions are so loud and you're going through heartbreak, or illness and you're like god and you can't formulate a thought you know because what happens when you think you know what happens when you start thinking about it your mind starts to race despair begins to you know the uh, isaiah speaks of a, of, of a spirit of heaviness now in his scripture what he was talking about is exchanging the spirit of heaviness for a garment of praise but i think a lot of times we talk about the garment of praise and not enough about the spirit of heaviness and sometimes life is heavy and so when, when life comes at you sideways and you are railroaded, use this method. Does it make sense? And so we, in this, we are going to anchor ourselves in those scriptures, like the Psalms or like the Book of Lamentations, or maybe the portions of scripture that deal with the promises 
of God, and we anchor ourselves in them, and we allow their structure to walk us through our cry before God. We allow their writing and their words to be the expression of our heart before the Lord. So it removes the part of where we're sitting here and trying to generate what to say, and we just go through it. So an example would be like Lamentations 3. Uh, all of you probably know the song, Great is thy faithfulness, right? 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 Like, morning by morning, new mercies I see. With me? That comes from Lamentations 3, if you didn't know. Of where it is one of the most hard emotion, raw pouring out of agony and despair and embarrassment in all of the scriptures. I remember my bitterness and my wandering. I, re I remember the wormwood or the poison. I remember the brokenness of everything that's just occurred. And it's like this for like half the stinking chapter. And then it comes to this. You ready? It says, but this I will call to mind. Great is your faithfulness. Your mercies are new every morning. And what it does is it allows us, like, in, in, seriously, read it. I'm, we're going to get there. I'm just telling you. Lamentations 3. Um, and, and what it does is it, it, it talks about the, the pain, and it leads us to a place of where it leads us naturally to coming back to God. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> uh, I think if we talk about the way that we're commuting, communicating, to, uh, communicating to God, there is a difference between reading it to study or just reading it to engage, and reading it of where those words are literally your cry before the Lord. There are times, and, and you, you, you know this, hard to explain, it's hard to articulate, but when I've studied the book of Lamentations, by the way, did you know that the first like four chapters of the book of Lamentations are an acrostic poem? You know that? Like each one is the beginning of a Hebrew letter of the alphabet, like all the way down? I didn't know that. Well, now I do. But I can tell you when I was going through the divorce in 2019, I went back there and I read it out loud. And I understood the difference. I had studied it for months. But then all of a sudden something in me begins to cry, God, I need you here. So you can read it but there's something different when your heart is behind it. When someone you're reading in the scriptures, you're reading someone else express what's going on in here. And if it were up to me, I would get lost in it. But the stru structure of the scriptures have a beginning and it has an end. And so it kind of allows me in the mess to work its way through. Does that make sense to everybody? Another example would be Psalm 30, Nabil Qureshi. Uh, he's passed away now. He died at the age of 34 from stomach cancer. Um, he, uh, he wrote the book, Find, uh, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. One of the greatest biographies you will ever read. I promise you that. One of the very few books that have driven me to tears. Uh, he was raised in a, obviously, very Muslim, as you can tell by his name. And uh, uh, ended up, you know, very academic. Like PhD, that whole thing. And he talks about how coming in a Muslim family loved Islam, loved it, and kind of how he came to face to face with God, how God kind of called him out of that and, in, and into, into his kingdom. And uh, when he was struggling with stage four stomach cancer, and the doctor said, you've got months to live. He ended up leaving about another three years after that. Um, he says this, he said, I would always go back to Psalm 30. And I won't spoil it for you. You can read Psalm 30, but the gist is this. It's, Psalm 30 is broken into these sections. Thank you, God, for your healing and your protection. Thank you, God, for your healing and your protection. Thank you, God, for your healing and for your protection. And then it gets to this middle bit where it says, please don't let me die. 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 God, thank you for your healing and your protection. Thank you for your healing and your protection. And for him, he had a little girl at the time. Uh, she was uh, two years old, turning three. And he said the thing that really hurt him the most is what he think about who was going to raise his daughter. And uh, he said that was what the enemy would just hit him with all the time. And he couldn't make sense of it because the feelings were too much. And so he'd go back to Psalm 30. Lord, thank you for your healing and your protection. Thank you for your healing and your protection. Thank you for your healing and protection. Please don't let me die. 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 Thank you for your healing and your protection. 
and, and he would allow that structure to carry him through that time of overwhelming fear um, and anxiety. Um, and so I, I'm saying this because I want you to understand the benefits of this particular approach. Um, this is what the, that's what the railroad method is all about, is that when life gets loud, the emotions get loud, grief, loss, fear, heartbreak, anxiety, uncertainty, betrayal. When these things happen, you've got to go to the Scriptures and let the Scriptures walk you through it. Make sense? So, uh, as you already have on the screen, what the railroad method does is it gives us a way forward. In the words of Chad Bird, it gives you a way forward when you do not know which way is up. When you don't know which way gravity runs because life has hit you that hard, it gives you a way forward. Number two is it trains you to seek God, seeking God for comfort instead of every other artificial thing. When we need comfort, we go to idols. I don't know how to explain this any better than that. We'll leave it at that. We go to idols. That's what happens. What this does is it trains us to go to God for comfort. And as you can see from the last one, this is, this is, this is something that no, I, I do not hear Christians articulate. But I know that every single one of us has lost that truth, the third point, in our ethos, in our world. There are so many times we need to be reminded that God can handle your big emotions. You're about to throw a tantrum, God can handle it. You're about to shake your fist at God and be like, where were you? God can handle that. You want to sit there and, and be like, God, I just, honestly, God, I just wish that you would just set their house on fire. God can handle that. Like, I, I when, when you... When you, when you look at the, the book of, of Ecclesiastes, when you look at the book of Job, when you look at, there are people who go through horrifying things and the different, and they're like, I, I don't, like, they're complaining and they're whining and they're hurting and they're broken. And there are things you're like, you get to say that to God? Like, how is that not a, how, how, how is that not a sin? That how, how are you, and the difference is because they're including God in the process. The last person I want to trust when I'm irate is me. Uh, right? Like the last person I'm going to trust when I'm broken is me. And what happens is, is because I don't know how to manage that, I have a nasty habit of going to other things to distract me. So I actually don't work through what I'm hurt, well, you know, what's going on. I just kind of try to shove it to the back of my mind and forget about it until it quiets down. And then the problem happens where, because I haven't processed anything. The moment that I'm reminded of it, it just all comes flowing back. Right? Like time heals nothing. I'm going to say this again. Time heals nothing. Time is not your here. Time helps you forget. That's all time does. Time helps you forget. And the moment that you're reminded, it all comes back. You want to know how you get through some of the worst pain, and some of you know this way more than me, where you have to work through it in the presence of God. There is no substitute. And this is something I actually learned from, from my wife, and she hates that I keep bringing this up. We were in a car ride going to a chiropractor in London, and she was just kind of processing some stuff that she'd gone through, and she goes, I just realized that the presence of God is the safest place to work through all of that. And I can tell you that in my head, I thought I always knew that. But then when it makes the 18-inch trip from here to my heart, I started to understand just how right she is. Let me tell you, there is no safer place, there's no better place to work through the hard emotions of life than in the presence of God. When you do it on your own, you're opening yourself up to the opinions of people that might not get it. You're leading yourself to places that just aren't going to feed you. They're just going to distract you. And then we start to get the idea that I can't really be angry in God's presence. Like somehow I've got to show up with my best behavior. Right? Like, like, and somehow expect that when I show up in my, like, in my tuxedo in God's presence, that he's going to somehow just believe that I've got everything together. Like he doesn't hear the crying and the brokenness of my heart before him. Like, come on. This is what the railroad method is all about. It gives you a way forward. It trains you to seek God. And it teaches you that God can handle the mess. That God can handle 
the big emotions. Here's how we do it well. And we're going to get to practice. I know we're a little bit. Here's how to use it well. Number one, understand the scripture in context. Um, this is kind of a big deal because the times when your world is upside down is the time when you are susceptible to using scripture incorrectly. When your world is upside down, you are susceptible to using scripture incorrectly. Okay, are you, you understand? When life is upside down, we are tempted to go to anything, anybody who might have a word that might make me feel like this pit isn't forever. And what it does is it allows me to, it kind of leads me to bait me into using scripture out of context. Let me give you an example. Psalm 46, verse 5. God is within her. She will not be toppled or she will not fail. God will help her when the morning dawns. Do you know how many people I've seen put that on a coffee mug and sell it to women? Unless you are the city of Jerusalem, that scripture has nothing to do with you. Because that's what it's talking about, right? So we want to understand scripture in context. I don't think I have to go through that too much. Um, number two, take it slow and repeat. When you're using the railroad method, take it slow. The first time, you're going to be like, blah, 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 because there's, there's a, lot of the, a lot that's got to come out. Go back, repeat it, slow it down. Go back and repeat it, slow it down. Go back and repeat it, slow it down. Go back and repeat it and slow it down. When you go to Psalm 50, um, Psalm 51, Psalm 51 of, of David, is, he goes before the Lord because of the Bathsheba incident. He's been called out by the prophet Nathan. So things are, this is the context of the scripture um, of where he goes in and he's like, he, he just comes before the Lord. I'm a mess. I have screwed up horrifically all the way through. You're, you're getting a chance to read it here in a bit. And he, and he says, he says, he says, return to me the joy of your salvation. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You can read that at 100 miles an hour, and you're like, that's pretty cool. And then when you slow down and you shift gears a bit, and you're like, God, return to me the joy. Give me back my joy of what it is to be saved by you. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't leave me here. Start to understand, it starts to hit a bit different. So when we read it in context, we want to slow it down, we want to repeat it, and here's the hardest part for everybody. Read it aloud. I will simply say this, and then we'll get to the practice part. Something incredible happens when you hear yourself reading Scripture. Because your spirit understands what you're expressing and your ears hear it, and it's like it teaches you all over again. Do not be afraid to open up your mouth. So much of our life of prayer is in here, of where we try to, try to talk our way through it, or we're reading it on a page. You've got to say it. It's a wonderful, it's a, it's a wonderful tool to use. Say it aloud. Um, Mark Colwell, uh, who used to be the district youth director for 12 years in the Western Ontario District of POC, she kind of youth pastor, he was the pastor of youth pastors for 12 years. Incredible man, serves out, leads out in BC now. Um, so when he was younger, he would be in the fetal position, crippled by anxiety. One of the greatest leaders we have, no joke. And when I heard this, I was kind of like a stunned, like textbook agog. Like it didn't make any sense to me because I'm like, this guy is so incredibly capable. And he said that he, every day he would have anxiety. He would be in the, the fetal position the whole time. And what he did is he wrote five promises of God on a sheet of paper that he kept in his wallet go everywhere he went so that when all of a sudden he, like, he's like, I would be trembling in the fetal position. I couldn't move for days. I would fight my way to my wallet. I would pull it out and I would read it out loud to myself. And he said, and I, it, it, took, it took practice. He would read it out loud. And as he would hear it, like it, it reteaches you. It's not just something that we... It's like, you know, when you're just reciting the Lord's Prayer because of rote memorization, and then you actually start to be conscious and you start to think about what it is that you're praying, and you're like, oh, this is feeding me in a different way. You know what I mean? Right? Like my Father who is in heaven, your name is holy. They sit there and you let it... You see, you see my point? He would do that, and if, he, if it took him years, it took him years and would literally cause him to unfurl, 
um, and to where now it doesn't come up at all. But every time he feels anxious, the first thing out of his mouth, and his wife can tell, first thing out of his mouth are those five promises. Incredible thing to do. So read the scripture, understand the scripture in context. Uh, one of the key things about understanding the scripture in context, by the way, is that in order to use the scriptures here, you have to know the scriptures. Um, I say this because a lot of us don't get into the word enough so that when you need a rock to stand on, you're looking for one. It's best to know the scriptures, have a, a good handle on it a little bit before you get to the point of where you need it. All right, here we go. Are we ready? Ooh, neat. Um, we're going to practice. Here's what's going to happen. Uh, Rebecca's going to put music on. You're all going to find your own spot in this particular room, and you are going to put into practice the two things that we just did. That's what we're going to do. So you are going to use the railroad method. You're going to use the campfire method, whatever one you want, for 15 minutes. That's what we got left. We've got 16 minutes left. So Rebecca, go ahead and play it. You're going to find your spots. I'm going to put some scriptures on the screen here that might provide for you a little bit of cut, like if you're looking for some, some scriptures to help. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to, when you're beginning to pray, I want you to write down the scripture you use and why. With me? Father, as we enter into a time with you right now, we pray that you would silence every distraction or that you would equip us to open ourselves up to you in this moment. Let this be our prayer place where we meet with you tonight. We trust you to lead us in this, to meet with us. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would do for them what you have done for me. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So go find your spot. If you need some scriptures, and then when we're... 15 minutes is up. We'll come back and then we'll talk about some other details. 15 minutes. Go ahead.
want you to know you don't have to be bound to this room. If you need to go somewhere where no one else is, you go and do that. Go to your car, go to the foyer, go for a walk outside the building if you have to. Don't feel like you have to be in this room.
I'm going to ask, uh, ask us all to kind of come back. Right at the very end, 15 minutes goes by pretty quick. I'll ask us all to kind of just come back and I'm going to, we'll conclude, I'll give you some homework. And, uh, How was that? How many people were like, this was pretty hard because the room and the distractions and the noise coming from this other room? How many people? Be honest with me. Straight up. We're on the same team. Yeah, okay, right. How many people were like, hey, this was incredibly easy. I love this. This is super. Okay, good. We have no liars in the room. Awesome. Uh, so I want to just, we have one more minute. I just want to conclude with something. Next week, we are not here. Next week is Halloween. And before you start throwing things at me, let me explain why. Halloween in Petrolia is very much a family thing. I grew up here. I know. We have a lot of parents, a lot of grandparents that are in the room. I don't want to rob you of an opportunity to spend time with your family and your grandkids. And one other thing with that whole thing is that number, reason number two is that next lesson, week two, will likely be the most difficult week for most of us for the lesson that we're learning. And I don't want anyone to miss it. And so I don't want to have that on a week when, not, you know, when, when I'm causing you to have to choose between being here and, and being with your family. I don't want to do that. And number three, because we've studied two things today, and so I think that we have enough to cover the, the next 14 days of practice. So here's your homework. The word school is used on purpose, which means there's homework, and I'm sorry to do that. I'm not that sorry. I'm not sorry at all. Here's your homework for the next two weeks. Use these approaches for the next two weeks. Find, the, let me change my, my wording here. You do not find time. You make time. Time is not found. You have the same amount of time every single day. You make the time. So make the time, even if it's even if it's only two minutes, even if it's five minutes. Like let me tell you, y'all remember the game show Minute to Win It? Okay, the minutes to win it, the minutes you spend with God. Let me tell you, no joke. Five minutes in the morning. This is my technique, by the way. Five minutes, five minutes in the morning. Usually you have to get up about fifteen minutes early because I drag my feet. Like I am like reluctant, defiant, even for getting out of bed. So I have to set my alarm for about fifteen minutes early, and I finally get about five minutes of time in the morning, and I spend the first minute just reading a portion of Scripture, and then I pray for the rest of the remaining of the time. If you do that every day for a month, it will change your life. So that's your homework. For the next two weeks, you are going to use these two methods. You can use campfire method, you can use railroad method. You choose. If I may, as part of the formative thing here, what I want you to do is if you have the five minutes in the morning, and then do five minutes before you start to wind yourself down. So not like, hey, I've watched a bunch of TV, and now I'm, you know what I mean? Like as you're beginning the wind down process, spend your five minutes with God. And here's why. You want to give God the night. Nighttime is when, when everything happens, when all the thoughts and condemnation and all the fear and all the anxiety, they get, they get loud, right? So five minutes in the morning, five minutes at night, like bookend your day. And don't do it right when you're getting into bed. Like do it like, okay, I'm going to start reading my book or watching TV or something. Do that before, like when you begin the wind down process from the end of the night. Do that right at the beginning of it. I promise you, it'll change your life for the next two weeks. And so I want you to use those approaches. And the next thing I want you to do is I want you to keep notes of the time you spend, your experiences, and the scriptures you use. You are going to have to journal here a little bit. Not a little bit, a lot. No one's marking it. I'm not asking you to sit there and show me your notes. It is for you. It is to bless you. It is to equip you. It's to train you. Keep a note of it. And I promise you, if you do this, you will be surprised at just how easy it is, just how helpful it is, just how healing it is, just how blessed it is. I promise. Okay? 
there has never been a time that I have gone into the presence of God and I have come out the same. So I'm going to leave it at that. 